thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this is my first SPICI conference and I'm really excited to be here, even if it's virtually. Um, I'm Anea Prosser, I'm a PhD student at the University of Bath and I'm specialising in social, moral and environmental psychology. And today I'm going to be talking about my research project, which is looking at polarising or uniting um, mandatory masks, practice perceptions and moral judgment. I truly believe that societal problems require collective solutions and we require individuals or all levels of society to change their behaviour in a lot of different ways to resolve some of the biggest moral issues that we face today like climate change or the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I focus on in my PhD is the influence of morality and morality can be an amazing and terrible thing for social change. And that's because morality can be a huge motivator for people who are really invested and it can be a way for people to make huge behavioral sacrifices for seemingly very little immediate reward. Morality is a double-edged sword and it can be really good for these people who are invested but it can also be an incredibly polarizing force for people who are yet to join the social change action and are yet to be truly convinced of the necessity of action and in invoking moral norms and moral arguments you can create further polarization between people who do and don't do a specific practice and you can also inadvertently by adopting moralized identities you can make practices that theoretically anyone could do the domain of a very specific moralized set of people so while veganism might be helpful for vegans the classification of veganism might not be helpful for people looking to reduce their meat and dairy consumption, but not get attached to that identity. So broadly speaking, this problem of morality, identity and practices is what my PhD is looking into. And I believe that social policy could be a solution to this issue. Um, a lot of social change efforts are kind of um, centered around the idea of policy change at the heart that um, after protests happen, policy and systemic like societal change will follow. Um, but we actually don't know too much about the social psychology of how these mandatory practices, practice based um, policies influence people's behaviour. So we've already seen these policies, they're quite like widespread within society, probably familiar with smoking bans or fire bans um, in wildfire areas and also even um, speed limits. And these policies take individual decision making completely out of the equation and replace it with a kind of societal understanding of what is correct and what is legal and what do we want people to do. So in theory, these policies could be a way of like unifying potentially moralized practices into the mainstream and taking away this issue of potential polarization and derogation. But we need to look at how individuals respond to these policies, whether they support them and how over the long term their social psych psychology changes as a result of these policies. In terms of my PhD, I explore the climate crisis and climate action is unfortunately very slow and climate policy is very protracted over time. And I was not sure if I was going to be able to find a policy mandating a moralised practice to study. But unfortunately for me, I'm doing a PhD during the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, is unfortunate in many ways, but it's fortunate in that it presented um, all of society with this novel moralized practice of wearing masks. And I won't bore you all with the details of wearing masks. I'm sure you're familiar with the argument. Basically, a mask is something that you wear to pre prevent aerosol particles from your own mouth going out into the general circulation. So it's supposed to prevent um, COVID-19 being passed on to vulnerable people. The argument is that wearing a mask protects others more than it protects yourself. And there was a bit of a debate on the efficacy of masks in the beginning, but last summer masks became really widely adopted as an effective um, solution to um, transmission of the virus. And here are just a couple of examples of like signs you might have seen um, about state or local law and national law in the UK enforcing these masks. So my question is, how does a mandatory policy of surrounding a moralized practice influence people's social psychological responses, their perceptions of morality, and their perceptions also of what everyone else is doing? 
Um, so this is what I set up to study. Um, the UK government um, brought um, a mandatory mask policy in about this time last year, actually. So in July 2020, um, so we surveyed people one week before the policy came in and we followed up with those people again uh, three months after the policy came in in October. And so this was a longitudinal study. Our total N for um, people who responded at both time points was 180. We had some more for the first time point, but obviously there was attrition over time, unfortunately. Um, so there were some people who wore a mask at, before they were forced to, and we called these the committed mask wearers because they'd already committed to wearing a mask before the policy came in. And there are 133 of these. And um, this was fairly soon before the policy came in, so it was starting to gain traction among the public. But also we had people who didn't wear a mask before the policy came in, and we called these um, people who converted. Everyone after the policy was forced to wear a mask in our sample, um, but 47 people didn't wear a mask before. So this design actually allowed us to test how um, the mandatory policy influenced people who already endorsed the behavior. So who were already like the early adopters and the com like the committed mask wearers and compare those to people who are forced to change their behavior as a result of the policy. So in terms of our research questions, um, we had a lot. This is a huge data set that I am yet to study all of our um, research questions. But just for this talk, um, we studied how does a mandatory policy surrounding a moralized practice influence people's moralization of wearing masks, the projected percentage of mask wearers in the general population, um, how much they were willing to wear a mask after the policy came out, and their willingness to confront a friend to wear a mask as well. So this idea of social confrontation. We were also interested in how committed mask wearers differed psychologically to those who converted and were converted mask wearers actually distinguishable from committed mask wearers after the policy came in. And we also have some qualitative data exploring people's talk to the out group. So we asked people um, if they could say anything to people who did the opposite behavior to them, what would they say? So I'll talk about that at the end. In terms of our quantitative design, so we had two independent variables, one of time points, so before or after the mandatory policy came in, and then another independent variable exploring mask behavior. So these people who wore masks before and after the policy and people who only wore masks after the policy, so the committed and the con converted. And in this presentation, I'm going to briefly go over the results of four of our dependent variables. That is willingness to confront a friend, willingness to wear a, a mask after the policy relaxes, moralization and predicted percentage of mask wearers in the general population. And now I'll move on to talk briefly about the qualitative results at the end. So in terms of moralization, so we explored moralization through um, a variety of um, seven point Likert scales questions. So we asked people like, how moral do you think it is to wear a mask? How immoral do you think it is to wear a mask? And these had good reliability as a scale measure. So what we found is that there were group level differences in how much people moralized the idea of wearing masks. So as expected, we found that people who consistently wore masks moralized masks more than people who converted. Um, but actually we can see that there wasn't that much change on time point. So the um, before or after the policy, both groups remained not significantly different. So no one really changed their perceptions of the morality of the behavior after the policy came in, um, according to our results at least. So in terms of predicted percentage of mask wearers, these results were really interesting. We saw huge effects of time point, obviously, as it became a mandatory behavior. But what is interesting about these results is that if you look at the convert, converts at the beginning underestimated the number of the population who were wearing masks compared to people who were consistently wearing masks and um, overestimated afterwards. So it suggests they're kind of like overcompensating to excuse their behavior change, um, which I think is really interesting. In terms of mask persistence, we also found that converts changed significantly from before to after the policy was introduced. There was no um, change in people who consistently wore masks. Um, and this graph on the left is if the COVID-19 case rate remains high, 
but we also found similar results if the um, COVID-19 case rate decreased, um, although these didn't significantly increase for the converts. Um, and then the final quantitative result is social confrontation. And this is actually featured in a paper that I've written with um, Letitia Mulder and Tim Kurtz and Miguel Fonseca, which is currently under review. And we found that people who converted to wear masks were just as likely to um, uh, confront a friend to also wear a mask as people who wore masks consistently were before policy intervention. So this is some evidence to suggest that they've kind of internalized the policy a little bit and they believe in it enough to enforce it on their friends, which is really strong evidence that um, policy has a kind of unifying effect, which is great. Um, so in summary, moralization differs between the converted and committed groups, but not across time points. Um, converts overcompensated post mandate implementation in their perceptions of how many people wore masks and converts were just as likely to continue wearing masks after policy intervention as a committed mask wearer was beforehand and converts were just as likely to confront a friend after policy intervention as committed mask wearers were beforehand. So this is quite strong evidence to show that the policy is having some psychological impact on people who have to convert. So very quickly, I'm going to run through the preliminary qualitative results. So we asked people this question, if you could talk anonymously and without consequence, is there anything you would want to tell people who either do or don't wear masks in public? If so, please explain it below. And this was targeted to the people who did the opposite behavior to the participant. So if they were someone who wore a mask, they'd be asked about people who don't wear a mask. And if they were someone who didn't wear a mask, they'd be asked about people who do wear a mask. And I've done a very, very preliminary uh, discourse analysis on this, exploring um, rhetoric devices, moralistic language and persuasive techniques. Um, yes, yeah, so we were interested in how each group tries to persuade the other group of the validity of their cause. So what would non-maskers say to pro-maskers? So we only had the non-maskers at time one. Um, and the emphasis here was very much on personal agency and choice. Um, they really felt like it was important for everyone to have a say over their own behavior and for no one else to dictate what they were able to do. So I think it's everyone's personal choice. I'm not putting my opinion on others. It'd be good if they could show the same courtesy, this kind of thing. And then what would pro-maskers say to non-maskers at time one? There was an emphasis on personal responsibility and also self selfishness and stupidity was invoked quite a lot. So they're stupid, you should read articles and research, why are you not wearing masks, you're selfish, costing lives just so you don't have to have a small inconvenience. So at time one these people were really angry and really emotive and at time two there was a slight difference, there was um, selfishness was still a focus but there were more pleas to a collective good, like please wear a mask, I know it's not 100%, um, the kind of attempts to persuade were a little bit more moderated um, at time two. And like I said, this is very preliminary analysis, but I hope these quotes are illustrative of what we found. So in conclusion, um, we found that mandatory policies reduce psychological differences between people who did and didn't wear masks before and after the policy. And our work suggests that mandatory policies might have a unifying influence and reduce practice-based group polarization division. And people who converted seem to internalize the policy over time, which has really important implications for policing and behavior change. Um, in terms of the future directions for this policy, like for this study, I'm hoping to do some work on tracking linguistic changes in group talk over time, seeing how much each group references we or I at time one and time two. And I also wanna test this um, in different areas, mainly the environmental domain as well. So like transport and food and see how mandates in that area influences behavior. And as a final point, um, this work obviously has huge implications for current mask policies. In the UK, it was just announced um, at time of recording, like a few days before the, um, the government was going to take away the mask mandate, um, despite the risk being very high. So we are going to be studying the impact of taking away a mandate as well. And I might have some preliminary results on that by the time you watch this presentation. So please ask me if you'd like to hear more about that. And you can also read more in our paper, um, which is cited there. So thank you very much for listening. And thanks for all of my supervisors. So Tim Kurtz, Leader Blackwood, Lorraine Whitmarsh, Jan Will and Balderdijk, and Saffron O'Neill. And thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. 
Um, if you want to get in touch, my email is at the bottom and my Twitter is also there as well.